How's it going, everybody? Good? That's it? <laughs> Just good? All right, I'm going to try and take you up a level, you know, by the end of this talk, and uh, let me know how I do. So yes, I'm Thompson, a Darren Comey, came all the way from Minneapolis today, and I want to talk first about an experience I had in graduate school. Uh, my first graduate degree came from the School of Statistics at the University of Minnesota. And so in the last part of your time in the graduate school, uh, you have to come up with a project that you need to do to graduate. And it's very important that you graduate on time. So I told my advisor what I wanted to do, and my advisor strongly advised me from doing it. He really didn't want me to do it. He, was afraid. he didn't even know if it was possible, what I wanted to do, first of all. And then even if it was possible, he wasn't sure if I could do it on time. But with some convincing, I was able to get him to grant my request uh, to embark on this journey. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to build an algorithm, I was calling it a machine, that could read ancient Greek texts. But it wasn't reading the content, it was reading it to ascertain the style of writing so it could tell you who wrote it, kind of like a fingerprint. And he really didn't want me to do that. Because he was like, Thompson, do you know how to read ancient Greek? And I was like, no, like, <laughs> I don't know how to read, but I can learn how to read ancient Greek in time to do this project. So I was planning pretty far ahead for this. And the amazing thing about that project that I did not anticipate was building the algorithm was the easy part. Building the models was not that complicated after the training I had received at the school. Uh, the hardest part was preparing ancient Greek texts in a format that a machine could read. And it took me two months to do that. And even myself, I was getting nervous that I would not graduate on time because a month and a half in, and I still couldn't even get the machine to read the text. You know, it's like having a book with a bunch of letters in it that you don't understand. And, but thankfully, I was able to figure it out uh, by the end of the second month. But the main lesson there for me was persistence. Like, I had this great idea. I thought it was a great idea. And without persistence, there's no way I could have finished, because I would have quit. And I would have done something like analyzing baseball stats or something of that nature. But what that did for me is it prepared me for entrepreneurship. Because just like my project, entrepreneurship is an idea plus persistence. And there are lots of ideas. I have sat at coffee tables hundreds of times talking to people about their ideas. Even some people that start their idea but it's persistence that actually makes a difference. In our country, we, we venerate and we hold on high these people that we believe came up with these amazing ideas. They identified some market need and took the risk to go and tackle it. Well, most likely, a hundred other people also came up with that idea. Like, it, the, the idea is not the hard part. But, and even taking that first step is not the hardest part. But sticking with it when there are very many logical points in your journey that you should stop. That is a hard part. And it's not like you're gonna die as an entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs, many entrepreneurs, come from good homes, good families, good education. They have backup plans. They can go back into the workforce and work. These aren't life or death decisions where you're like, I'm not gonna stop or else I'm gonna die. This is a crazy mental game you're playing with, with yourself, convincing yourself every day not to stop. I went back to school after working as a healthcare economist, uh, analyzing programs, efficacy studies, all the payment and healthcare forms and claims analysis you could dream of. I did that for quite a few years. But then I went back to school, got my MBA at the University of Minnesota, and I started a company, a healthcare company, uh, right in the school. And I did not persist in that one. It was a great idea. How do I know it was a great idea? because fast forward seven years, there are companies literally doing what me and my co-founder were trying to sell. It was an artificial intelligence healthcare data company in 2009, and at that point, the healthcare world wasn't ready for that kind of crazy talk, uh, but they are today. So perhaps if I would have persisted, I would have hit it big. I have not made my millions yet, so I'm still trying to make those millions, and so I tried another company after that, and I didn't persist with that one either. And I tried a third company after that, and I didn't persist with that one. I had these ideas. I had the courage to take the leap 
and not get a regular job and go down this entrepreneurial pursuit. I, could con I had the ability to convince people to quit their safe jobs and join me you know, on these journeys. But I didn't persist. So now I'm on the fourth one, because I am not going back to corporate. Like, that is not happening to me. And at least that's one area I persisted in, right? Like, I persisted to not get a regular job. And so I persisted and started a fourth company. It was called Retrace Health. And I took all my knowledge as a healthcare veteran, if I can call myself that, and my passion for disrupting healthcare in the primary care space and the delivery of primary care in addition to the financing of that primary care. And two years went by with almost no revenue. Like two years. And I was paying technology costs. I was paying medical providers, my practice insurance. I was speaking all over the country. I was going to all these huge co other companies trying to sell them our wares and goods. And the first two years, we probably brought in a total of $75,000. Like, not very much. I remember at one point, I had maxed all my credit cards. I had borrowed money, even from my brothers, my parents. Payroll was looming in the not-so-distant horizon. And I didn't know what I was going to do. But I didn't quit. I didn't stop. And we made it past that two-year point. We raised a million dollars, and we raised another $7 million. Things started to take off in selling our, our, selling our services. Our contract value started increasing. And I could look back at, at this point now, three years in my entrepreneurial journey. My fourth company was finally working. I was so excited. And not only that, I was disrupting the beast of healthcare, completely obliterating it. And then, Unfortunately, at least it seemed at the time unfortunate, my investors uh, kicked me and my co-founder out of the company without warning, four months after investing in us. And everything just went down the tubes. Four months after that, the company shut its doors, despite the tremendous success it was having. And everybody knew it was, hap it was happening. So here I finally thought I was going to make it, make my millions as an entrepreneur, and change the healthcare system, and it was dashed to pieces in a few minutes. So I already knew that persistence was the main thing that got me to the point I'd gotten to, so I persisted, and I went back to my third company that I'd quit on five years ago. It's probably hard to keep track of all these timelines. So instead of starting a new company, coming up with a new idea, I always knew that third company had something. I always knew that it meant something maybe even more than that fourth company that almost made it. And the reason is because the idea that I had for that third company was about relationships. That even if we solve all the world's problems, that we fail to properly invest in our relationships, both our nuclear relationships, like our partners, our spouses, our children, our parents, in addition to the relationships that we have with other countries, and hopefully one day other worlds and other galaxies, don't invest in these things, it won't matter if we solve all the basic needs problems. Human progress for me, and hopefully I can convince you of this as well, is basic needs plus our relationships. We have to do both. But when you look at our economy today, our economy is almost entirely focused on meeting basic needs. And think about it. Just, just take a couple seconds and think about all the companies you love and enjoy, the brands, the experiences, the things you do. And at their core, they're meeting some basic need or they're trying to convince you that this is a basic need and that's why you should give them their money. But how many companies are trading right now in the public markets? How many companies do you spend your money at that are focused on helping humans have better relationships. This picture, you can kind of tell what's happening in the picture, but to me this picture represents humanity 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, there was no time for relationships because you were so worried about your basic needs. And basic needs were so scarce and so hard to come by that it actually meant a lot of sense to do quite a bit of harm to your neighbor or the neighboring tribe or the neighboring country. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Like, like humanity 4,000 years ago 
was so concerned with survival that it couldn't truly experience happiness in the way we talk about happiness today. So we decided to focus on basic needs as a species, especially in healthcare. We're all about the basic needs, are we not? For example, life expectancy at age 65 has increased 40% between 1950 and 2010. That's just one measure. I could have picked any measure. I thought it was a good measure. I thought it was better than, better than life expectancy at birth because of all the issues statistically that you have there. But life expectancy at age 65 has increased quite a bit. And the quality of life is pretty good after age 65. Compare that to 4,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 500 years ago. 200 years ago, I couldn't even be on the stage because of the color of my skin. And I certainly wouldn't have lived past the age of 65. We've invested a lot in basic needs in our entire economy, but especially in healthcare. But let's suppose we actually solve the basic needs problem, right? Let's solve that problem by adding some color to this picture. So this picture, again, represents humanity from my point of view. And it's still out of focus. It's still not clear. But at least we have some color. At least there's a little bit more pizzazz and excitement to life, right? Because we're not worried about basic needs. We're not worried about shelter. We're not worried about food. We're not worried about health. But life is not complete with just the basic needs. And again, I really want to challenge people to think about it, because we, we're so driven by technology and science and advancements to meet these basic needs, because it's always about the basic needs. Even going to Mars is about the basic needs, about staying alive. You're going to have friends on Mars? You're going to get along with your partner, your wife, your husband on Mars? What happens if you're on Mars and you get into a fight? with your wife, hmm? and, you're, and you're the only couple there? Or, or what, if you have, what if you're the only family on Mars and you got a two-year-old and, and your husband? I got a one-year-old and a six-year-old at home, and man, like that changes life for a very happy couple. For a very happy couple. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the couple that's not happy? How much does that one-year-old or six-year-old change life for them? I would wager a whole lot. My relationship with my wife is very resilient. I've been married 13 years, and we love each other a lot. Like, I can't wait to get back home to my wife. And I love my kids, like, right, a little bit right here. But my wife is definitely right here. Because to, me, to me, that's important. And suppose I just provided for the basic needs for my wife, right? Like, shoes, clothes you know, nice house, you know, food. But I neglected investing in our relationship. It might work out for a while, but not for very long, I say. So let's solve the basic needs problem and let's solve the relationship problem. Now we have a picture that's worth looking at. Now we have a picture that can make you smile, puts that little twinkle in your eye, you go, oh, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's my son, uh, my second son, he's one year old, uh, just hanging outside the front of the house. And for me, I know my job is more than just providing for his basic needs. It's tempting sometimes as a very driven, very aggressive, very kind of hungry entrepreneur to say, and kind of reason with myself, I'm working all these, or I should work all these hours, I should be gone from home, I should not be present even though I'm physically in the same room because I'm working on this great thing. I'm working on this big thing that's gonna change all these lives. It's gonna change your lives. That's what every founder says to themselves. But what does it profit me if I gain the world but lose my soul? What, what's the point of saving everybody else except the people that I live with. That is where I think we have to start thinking when it comes to where we invest our resources, where we invest our time. Everybody is in relationship, and everybody wants to have this big impact. Okay, not everybody, right? But most people want to have this big impact on the world. This huge impact on these systems, 
on these, whether systems that are good or bad, on these people in other countries, other cities, neighborhoods. But what about the people that sleep in the same house as you? Like, can we start there? Like, can we master that? Can you imagine if we were as good at extending life beyond age 65? Suppose we were just as good at that as we were at being married to one another or being parents to one another. Let's just start with those. Or being in a relationship with one another if you're not allowed to get married. Like, what if we were really good at that, or at least, at least as good at that as we are at meeting our basic needs? Like, how much better would the world be? At Relate, what I say is, if we can make 10% of relationships 10% better, the world will be 100 times better. Like, for, for me, even just this room, if everybody in this room goes home to whoever they go home to, if there's no one at your home, then the next best thing, and you were 10% better for that person or those people, 10% more engaged, 10% more forgiving, 10% more positive, 10% more easygoing, if you could just do that, a little more often. And then we all did that a little more often. The world to become this amazing place that I would want to call home. And then maybe the aliens will come. Because I think that's what's keeping the aliens from coming, <laughs> is that we're not so loving. Thank you. <laughs>